Today, we're going to tackle a very controversial topic. Can diabetics drink diet sodas? This is a topic that seems to have all the books more educated diabetic experts who are not diabetic preaching the evils of diet sodas. This video will be an eye-opener, very different from anything you've heard before. So please keep an open mind here. But before we begin, let me welcome all the resilient diabetics out there. I am Jay Sampat, and this is where we turn ordinary struggling diabetics into extraordinary well-controlled diabetics. I have personally heard every reason why I should give up my delicious, crisp, delightfully caffeinated, aspartame enriched beverage of choice. It's death in a can from what I've been told. Today, I'm gonna to take the other side of the argument. I will explain why many of these claims are unstabiated, misleading, and pretty much unproven. So stay tuned for the very end, and I'll explain how and why using diet drinks may even improve your health, especially as a diabetic, but certain criteria have to be met first. So, what are the claims being made against this very popular beverage? One, it's going to give me cancer. Two, it's addictive like cocaine. It's definitely going to make me fat. It interferes with my gut microbes. It's going to increase my belly fat. It's going to cause me to overeat. I've also read drinking this horde concoction also puts me at significant risk of having a stroke heart attack, and type 2 diabetes, which I'm diabetic already, so. But worse, I could be diagnosed with dementia. So let me get this straight. All the internet experts out there are stating that these nasty chemicals in these drinks are going to make me lose my mind too. I saw a new video the other day, and according to that video, diet soda is going to give me type 3 diabetes. That's a new one. It's less unhealthy than consuming real sugar. First diabetics? Wow. Where on earth do I begin? All these lovely assertions play into our deepest of fears. Now, are they justified? Should we all be worried? So let's get into some interesting statistics on diet sodas and sweeteners that you may not be aware of. Saccharin was first synthesized in 1879. By 1907, saccharin was already widely used in sodas and canned foods, but most Americans had no idea it was even, actually even in their food. So when something was marketed as even sweeter than sugarcane, and it was also cheaper to make and sweeter by weight, what are the opposing forces going to do? They're not going to like that. This is Competition 101. It's a war. Certain opposing industries need to take the other out for survival. How? A smear campaign began. It was then banned and then brought back. By 1979, about 44 million Americans use saccharin daily. Today, about one-fifth of the U.S. population consumes diet drinks on any given day. A 2000 Gallup survey found out that 24% of Americans regularly drink diet soda, compared to 32% who drink regular soda, and about 43% who drink no soda at all. Now, diet soda sales are down, but the move to energy drinks and functional drinks has increased, especially those no-carb, zero-carb energy drinks. Now, what about the artificial sweeteners? They are in more than just diet sodas. The gums you chew, all the low-carb versions that we consume when we eat. So just remember, folks, it's not just the diet sodas we're talking about. They're in just about everything we do eat. Now, according to a 2016 study that was published in the Journal of Academics of Nutrition Dietetics, nearly half of the adults and a quarter of the children in the U.S. consume artificial sweeteners and the majority do so on a daily basis. Diet drinks do make up a bulk of that intake. So, with so many of the population consuming diet sodas and sugar-free sweeteners, then based on the claims we are supposed to then believe, 
we are then looking at an apocalypse, carnage. But that has not occurred. So the first thing we need to do is take a step back and look at some realities. When was the last time you turned your TV on or your radio or you surfed the internet to see or hear people dying off, developing cancer due to diet sodas? By this point in time, with the vast amounts of people consuming them, the truth should have and will have manifested itself. Just like smoking is to lung cancer, I don't know, I don't know about you, but I can only speak for myself, but I haven't seen it yet. So without going into detail on each and every study, I will try and explain how and why these conclusions are drawn in general, why the misleads occur, and for what purpose, who gains from the misinformation, and it's not what you think. First, let's begin with who they use in many of these studies to prove or disprove safety, the participants. We can begin with a widely reported 4,000 plus people aged 45 and older study that claims those who drink one or more diet sodas every day were three times more likely to have a stroke than those that did not. That study did not even prove that diet sodas themselves were the cause, if you read that study closely. Were the participants they chose who drank diet sodas already be at risk of these conditions such as diabetes, or obesity, because they were unhealthy to begin with? For example, Someone who is overweight may have switched from regular soda to diet soda to help control their weight. What percentage of the population consumes diet drinks? Now, if they even looked at that statistic, 32% of overweight people versus 19% of inline population drink the diet versions. So people who are overweight use the diet version to help control weight with no modifications to their diet. So in other words, this is not rocket science here. They blame the diet sodas as the cause when the overweight participants also consume more calories and more refined carbs than their peers. So the participants of the studies were eating poorly to begin with. These are the ones that will go to the fast food restaurant, order a double cheeseburger, a large fries with chili cheese, an apple pie and a diet soda. And then they will blame the diet soda for the stroke. In other words, the vast majority of those in these studies um, were non-controlled overweight participants who also consume more calories, more refined carbohydrates, and they don't exercise. Then there are studies that blame weight gain on diet sodas. The deviant flaw, the people in those studies do not report or count the calories and little is known about the rest of their diet. Basically, the one variable they do know is that they drank diet soda. In 2013, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition did a fantastic study. Now, this one was controlled. They asked the question, does diet beverages intake affect dietary consumption patterns. So what they did was they randomly assigned subjects to substitute the regular sodas that they drank for either water or a diet beverage. Oh, that's beautiful. Both groups, the water and the diet soda drinkers did reduce absolute intakes of total daily energy needs. That includes carbohydrates, fats, total sugars, and added sugars. The kicker of this study the diet soda group had a greater reduction in sweet dessert intake than the water group by month six. Wait a minute. The diet sodas actually curved appetite towards sugary desserts and junk food? Yes, it did. Now, that is something you and I already know as diabetic. If it helped curve appetite and satiates us, then there's less hunger less misery, and then less insulin use. And this study will not get much attention because it goes against the narrative of the sweeteners and most importantly, the sensational headline news. Only sensational headline news gets your attention and then gets repeated as fact. Positive news does not. Now, what about the cancer studies? 
that started all of this. How was that possibly contrived? Do huge amounts of saccharin produce cancer? Yes, bladder cancer. In rats. But first, what doses did they use in those studies? Ones you and I use to consume on a regular basis? No. They stacked the deck with doses far exceeding what you and I could consume in 10 lifetimes, but in a short time frame. It's like having a rat consume a swimming pool worth of saccharin per day and then expecting bliss. And not only that, but what type of rat was used? Could have been one that frequently was infected with bladder parasites that would leave it susceptible to saccharin-induced bladder cancer? Hmm. Even though this study is reported and rehashed to this day, that link between bladder cancer has never been confirmed in humans ever, only in those susceptible rats. What's worse? It turns out that some rats are just more likely to get bladder cancer. Feed them similar doses of vitamin C, and guess what? They get bladder cancer too. I'll repeat that one important point. None of the studies have been replicated in humans with the same results. This is a powerful tool our wonderful media uses whereby journalists will take a piece of reasonably humdrum everyday research, in most cases just observational studies, looking for associations. And then what they do? They turn it into fear. The artificial sweeteners we use have been tested more than almost any other product you'll come into contact with in your life. Aspartame, also marketed as NutraSweet or Equal, is one of the most extensively studied chemicals that has ever been approved for food supply. Additionally, all new sweeteners go through more than 100 safety studies, including cancer studies, before it hits the market. So let's get into these facts, or lack of truths, and why are they reported? Well, I explained earlier, this is economics competition 101. If I want to take my competitor out, I will pay for a study that skews data into my favor. I'll use participants and lab animals that are compromised. The first things we learned during some of our advanced classes in nutrition dietetics when dissecting and designing studies was to see who paid for that study. No one's going to pay for a study that goes against themselves. Once that poorly designed study is done, it'll eventually make its way out into mainstream media via the TV, the internet, and the hope is that it goes viral. You see it, you read it, and most importantly, you repeat it. You're not going to have the time to go into those studies and dissect the flaws and then explain to everyone, and neither will the reporter who's broadcasting that news. The media's job is not to teach and inform you, but to keep your attention. The scarier the broadcast or the headline news, the greater your response, the more you'll repeat it. So I'll give you a great example. So you've just got home. It's time to settle in for a little prime time news at 7 p.m. And you see your favorite broadcaster say, stay tuned. There's a new study that shows diet sodas cause type 3 diabetes. So you end up calling your husband, hey, Frank, Frank, come here, watch this. I told you your diet soda is going to kill you one day. So what do you do? You stay tuned through that commercial. They have your attention. Now for the interesting point. What commercials do you see run during your primetime news? This is a serious question. If you haven't paid attention, you will now. Yes. Medications. Cholesterol medications. Diabetic medications. Advertisements for some new drug. Take notice. That is not coincidence. Just like I see in the diabetic forums, the number one question I see asked by newly diagnosed diabetics is if they can drink diet sodas. And then the attack begins. And I get it. This message of doom and gloom works and it gets repeated. And for some, it's a black or white issue. Once someone believes something due to the negative news, not much is going to change their mind. Am I saying diet sodas are completely healthy? No. 
Diet sodas will not create a better, healthier diabetic unless certain fundamentals are in place first. You will remain unhealthy if diet sodas are the base of your diet regardless. Remember, diet sodas have no nutritional value. Zero calories does not equal healthy. If you notice in my videos, I focus in on the foods that are really highly nutrient dense items. The cruciferous vegetables, the dark green vegetables. These are the ones that are low in calories, high in vitamins, minerals, and the, and the antioxidants that we as diabetics need. Fluid intake. Diet sodas and our juices should not be the main source of liquid intake. Plain water is critical for us diabetics, especially if one has sugar levels that hover in the higher end of the spectrum. We need our systems to be well hydrated to keep the kidneys healthy. One cannot substitute diet sodas for plain water. Remember this, sodas, especially the darker versions, do have caffeine. Caffeine, besides being a stimulant, is also a mild diuretic too. And there are some exceptions to the rule. Mountain Dew, it's a light colored diet drink, but it does have caffeine. Your diet sprites, your 7-ups, your squirts, they will not. And if you're gonna be drinking a diet soda at night, it may be a better option so that it does not interrupt sleep. I have said, controlling blood sugars is one of our top goals. But just as important, if not more so, is controlling insulin and the amounts we need too. Too much of excessive carbs is the main culprit for our health. That is why many refer type 2 diabetes as a progressive disease. And I hate that term because it does not have to be. If diet sodas can help curve appetite, lessen that sweet tooth, lower the need to snack on high concentrated refined sugars, thus reducing the need for more medications or progressive doses, the key, then that risk to reward is shifted in our favor. Because in the end, it's not the diet soda that's gonna kill us, but it's the lack of knowledge towards the right diet for you in particular. And in the end, the main real culprit for us diabetics is carbohydrates. The purpose of this video is not to encourage excessive use or to claim diet drinks are necessary at all or to be consumed at all. You and your doctor alone have to decide what's best for you. I can only speak for myself here, but I cannot happily eat cake and cookies as I please. But I also have to avoid and severely limit those delicious carbs like pasta, bread, and pizza too. These, these are the carbohydrates that socially bind us together. Not being able to go to bed with a full stomach of carbs and then worry about the serious ramifications is my day-to-day -day battle. Excuse me for wanting to enjoy something sweet that allows me to feel human from time to time. But the key to everything, folks, is moderation. So if you found this episode helpful, please hit those alerts. That gray bell on top of the screen, the subscribe button. And if you like what you heard today, the like button. It is super important for us new channels. The more you hit those alerts, the more YouTube promotes this channel, the more people will get to see it. That's why I ask. I do understand the passions this episode may bring. And I would like to hear what you have to say. So please feel free to put your feelings down in the comments section. If you do drink diet sodas, diet teas, or any drinks, list them out for us diabetics. If it helps curve appetites towards carbs, then it's worth it. So, have a great day, a productive weekend, and we'll see you soon with a new episode that's released weekly. Bye-bye.